Nehemiah had to take a break from the wall to deal with some other problems. There were some people uh, in some positions of power, and they were taking advantage of other people. It was hard times, and those who had a little bit of money and power were, were sticking it to the ones who didn't. And Nehemiah addressed that and said, Hey, look, we are, we are, all, we are all God's people. You shouldn't, be, you shouldn't be doing this. And so Nehemiah was appointed governor. And he put a stop to those things. He said, hey, here's what needs to happen. We need to start doing what is right. And so Nehemiah stood up for the people. Uh, he was a good leader for the people. The, the people who were leading the people weren't, didn't really have the people's best interest in mind. They were trying to, to, to uh, benefit themselves. And Nehemiah says, no way. And Nehemiah didn't take from any of the money that was, that was allotted for him as governor. He didn't want to put any extra bind on the people. And so uh, Nehemiah stepped up and said, I, I want to lead these people in the right way. And that's what we saw in Nehemiah chapter 5. And then uh, tonight we get back to the progress on the wall and things have gone very well. The people have worked hard. They have made great progress and in spite of the opposition that they had, we've seen some a few names mentioned on, on a few occasions up to this point, some people who were really trying to hinder the progress. They did not want the Jewish people back in the land. They did not want the walls to be rebuilt, and they had tried to discourage them with words. They had taunted them. They had mocked them, and even uh, their life was in jeopardy. Their enemies were coming against them, and so Nehemiah and the rest of the workers they continued to work hard. They, they, they kept guard. They kept their, their sword on them even while they were bathing, it says. They kept their sword at their side, and they worked with one hand and kept the sword in their other. And so even in the midst of opposition, they were continuing on with the work to build the walls. And that's what we've seen up to this point in Nehemiah. And so tonight we will uh, begin in Nehemiah 6. But before we do, let's pray. Father God, I pray that as we read your word tonight, that your Holy Spirit would bring something from this that we need to hear. God, I pray that you would help me to be focused tonight. I pray that you would help my mind not to be distracted with the worries of the world, but God, that your Holy Spirit just fill my mind and let, let your words come from my mouth. And so God, I pray that you just let us, let us continue to hear this story and, and see how you're working in it. And God, let there be some applications in our life for how we can live for you and serve you and stand up in the midst of our oppositions. I pray that all this tonight will be for your glory, God. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Amen. Nehemiah 6, verse 1. When Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that no gaps were left in it, though at that time I had not installed the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me a message. Come, let's meet together in the villages of the Ono Valley. But they were planning to harm me. So here at the beginning of this passage, we see a list of these people in particular, Sanbaya and Tabala, uh, excuse me, Sanballat and Tobiah that we've seen up to this point. We've also seen Geshem. Uh, but these were the enemies that were trying to stop Nehemiah and the work that was being done. And they were the ones that mocked, saying, look, that wall you're building, a fox wouldn't even be able to run on that thing without it falling down. But lo and behold, they had successfully built a wall. Now, the wall was partially there, but they still had a lot of work to do. And they had, they had filled in all the gaps, all the bad spots. They had repaired them, and they had built new wall where it needed to be built. And things were going well, and they could not stand it, the enemies of Nehemiah. They were, they were, they were, just, they were enraged at what had taken place. And so they called for Nehemiah to meet him, but... Nehemiah knew better than that because he knew that they were planning to harm him. They didn't like what Nehemiah was doing, but really it was what, was, it was what God was doing. And Nehemiah had said that. He said, look, it's because of God's strength that we're able to build this wall. And so God had brought them there. God had protected them from the enemy. And as much as the enemy tried to keep them from doing the work, Nehemiah and the rest of the folks there worked together and continued on. Verse 3, So I sent messengers to them, saying, I'm doing a great work and cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same proposal, and I gave them the same reply. Sanballat sent me this message a fifth time by his aide, who had an open letter in his hand. And it was written, It is reported among the nations, and Geshem agrees, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. 
This is the reason you are building the wall. According to these reports, you are to become their king and have even set up the prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim on your behalf. There is the king in Judah. These rumors will be heard by the king. So let's confer together. So, Sanballat is upset. He cannot get Nehemiah to come to him. He sends him request after request, and finally he sends his personal aid to Nehemiah with a letter that says, look, we know what's going on. We know that you Jewish people are planning to rebel, and, and you're going to make yourself king among the people. We know all about your plan. We know all that's going on, and when the real king of the land hears about what you're doing, it's going to be, it's going to be bad. Your plan is out. Word is out. We are on to you guys. So let's meet and talk about this, he said. He really, he really wants to get together with Nehemiah. But Nehemiah is too wise for that. He's too smart for that. He knows what Sanballat has in mind. That he, he doesn't want to just talk with Nehemiah. He doesn't want to work it out. He doesn't just want to have a good conversation. He wants Nehemiah to be gone. Now, I don't know if Sanballat would, was planning to kill Nehemiah or what he wanted to do, but possibly that's the case. And maybe Nehemiah knew uh, that whatever, whatever that Sanballat had in mind, it was not going to be for the good of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah replied to him in verse 8, There is nothing to these rumors you are spreading. You are inventing them in your own mind. For they are all trying to intimidate us, saying, They will de become discouraged in the work, and it will never be finished. But now, my God, strengthen me. And so here is this tactic that we've seen throughout this book, a tactic of discouragement. And discouragement is a good tactic because when we feel discouraged and overwhelmed, then it's very easy for us to kind of give up with whatever we're doing. It's very easy for us to want to throw in the towel. Even if the people who are coming against us falsely and, and spreading lies and making things up, Nehemiah said, this ain't true. You know it's not true. This is all rumors. You're making this up. These are lies. I'm not worried about your lies. But what about us? What about us when we have situations that come against us that discourage us? Or people that come against us and discourage us that really, it really kind of, it really kind of pours on and they take stabs at us and, and there's lies that are said about us and rumors that are spread about us. Maybe you've, you've experienced that. Maybe there's been rumors that have been spread about you. Something that you, you haven't done, you're not guilty of, but yet, man, you're feeling the pressure of that. And it's discouraging. It's discouraging in our normal everyday life, and it's certainly discouraging when we try to do the Lord's work. And you better believe that our enemy, the devil, wants to do whatever he can to discourage us and keep us down. Because a discouraged Christian is, is probably not going to be as effective for the Lord as God wants he or she to be. If we, if, we, if we allow the devil to steal our joy, he can't steal our salvation, but man, he can sure steal our joy. He can stir, sure fill us with discouragement, and it kind of hinders us sometimes from doing the thing that God wants us to do. Perhaps you've battled that sometimes with something that God has put on your heart. Man, in ministry sometimes, maybe you've, you've, you've felt that if you've ever taught a Sunday school class or, or did any kind of ministry of any sort. There may be days where you say, I can't do this anymore. Even pe preachers sometimes, as hard as it may be to believe, sometimes feel like, man, I don't know if I can do this anymore. Now, why? Because the Lord doesn't want us to be successful and grow in Him and to share His love and to share the joy of the Lord with other people. He wants us to stop doing His work. He wants us to stop supporting missions and stop praying for people and stop preaching the Word and stop teaching the Word and stop the ministries that God has, has put before us. And a good way that he does that is discouragement. And I'll admit that he's been successful at times discouraging me and times that maybe I haven't served the Lord as well as I should because of discouragement. But Nehemiah here, he doesn't give in to those tactics. He says, no way. He says, I know what you're trying to do, and I know that these things are lies and rumors, and I'm not going to let you stop me from the work. I got work to do, he says. I'm not going to stop and go talk to you and listen to your lies. I got work to do for the Lord. And so he stood up to his enemy, and he fought against his enemy in a sense, in this, in this battle of words back and forth in these letters. And he said, look, I'm not going to listen to you, but God is going to strengthen me. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to get through your attacks and the lies and the rumors, 
and God is going to strengthen me, and it's all going to be all right. And the same is true in our life. We need to be like Nehemiah and trust the Lord. Verse 10, I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was restricted to his house. Now, I don't know why this guy was restricted to his house. It really doesn't tell us this here. But he went to see this guy, and this guy's going to give him some advice. And he says, uh, let us meet at the house of God inside the temple. Let us shut the temple doors because they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you tonight. Okay, so Sanballat had sent this request that uh, Nehemiah needed to come and talk because... They were on to his plan. Nehemiah says, I ain't got no plan, you bunch, you bunch of liars. Just leave me alone. So then he sees this other guy and this says, oh, wait, I, I, got a, I got this message for you. You've got to come to the temple. You've got to come to the house of the Lord because your life is in jeopardy. I know what's going to happen. They're about to kill you. You're about to die if you don't run and hide from these people who want to take your life. So now Nehemiah's got something to consider. Oh, my, what do I do, right? Now my life is in danger. So what is Nehemiah's response when he hears this, this word from this guy that he goes to see? Well, we see that in verse 11. But I said, should a man like me run away? How can I enter the temple and live? I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him because of the prophecy he spoke against me. Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was hired so that I would be intimidated. Do as he suggested, sin, get a bad reputation, and get a bad reputation in order that they could discredit me. So Nehemiah hears these words from this guy. He says, oh, you better look out. You better run and you better hide in fear because if you don't do that, you're going to die. And Nehemiah listened to this guy and he said, should I run away? Should a man like me run away? I think maybe what he meant there, a man like me who's, who's called to leave these people and take care of these people and, and, and be an example for these people, should I run away from this threat that's on my life? Should I run to the temple like a coward? No way, Nehemiah says. He said, this word of prophecy is not from God. This isn't God telling me to flee from my life. This is my enemy who sent this man to me. They want me to flee. They want me to look like a coward. They want me to, to, to be discredited in front of the people so they can say, look at him. Look at this guy. He doesn't care about you guys. He's not trusting in the Lord. He's running for his life. He's hiding out in the temple. Nehemiah said, no way. I'm not giving in to your tactics. I'm not going to be discredited. I'm not going to run away and hide. Man, I look at this and I think, I wish I could be like more like Nehemiah. Because sometimes in the midst of, of my struggles, when I'm discouraged and I feel like somebody or something's coming against me, sometimes I do kind of shrink back. I mean, maybe there's some times that I stand strong and say no. But if I'm honest, there are other times where I do kind of give in. I do let my fear get the best of me. But Nehemiah, man, he gives us a good example. He says, may the Lord be my strength. And when that next attack came, he said, I'm not going to give in. I'm going to stand up to these guys. I don't care what they do. And then he says in verse 14, May, or excuse me, my God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat for what they have done. And also Noadiah, the prophetess, excuse me, the prophetess and the other prophets who wanted to intimidate me. So Nehemiah says, I will not be intimidated. God, you will be my strength, but you will be their downfall. So God, you remember me and you remember them. Remember what they're doing. Look at their ways. Look at their tactics. Look at how they're trying to destroy your people and the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the walls for your city. God, remember what they're doing. What they're doing is wicked and evil. They're trying to intimidate me, but God, I will not be intimidated. We need to learn from Nehemiah here, and maybe we can find some strength in his, in his reaction. Verse 15. The wall was completed in 52 days. On the 25th day of the month of Elul, that's probably around September. When all our enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were intimidated and lost their confidence, for they realized that this task had been accomplished by our God. 52 days is all it took. Nehemiah and the people, he routed them. He said, here's what we're going to do. we rebuilding this wall, and they said, yeah, let's go get it. They started rebuilding the wall, and the people come against them, and Nehemiah said, don't give in. 
God is our strength. God will rebuild this wall. And the people said, all right, Nehemiah, we behind you. And Nehemiah said, look, we're not going to put up with any junk in this wall. We're not going to take advantage of each other. We're going to do what's right. We're going to live for the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. And we're going to keep on building this wall. And they came at him again. And Nehemiah said, I'm going to keep on building this wall. And 52 days later, Nehemiah and the people, by the power of God, built a wall. The people who tried to intimidate Nehemiah, the roles are now flipped. Because what does it say? It says, when all of our enemies heard this, all the surrounding nations were intimidated and lost their confidence. That's exactly what the enemies wanted Nehemiah to do, to be intimidated and to lose his confidence. But he didn't lose his confidence because his confidence was in the Lord. But the other people lost their confidence because the same Lord that had helped Nehemiah build the wall was the same Lord that was going to defend his people. And the other nations looked at what happened and they probably said, whoa, can you believe this? This group of ragtag Jews that came back in here with this destroyed city and they done rebuilt the temple and they done rebuilt the walls. And the other nations begin to lose confidence. Maybe not so different than it was when God's people went into the promised land and they begin to take over other places. And those other places begin to hear about places that had fallen. And they begin to lose a little confidence too because they knew the power of the Lord. And Nehemiah and the people with Nehemiah showed God's power and what God was able to do. And Nehemiah's enemies weren't able to stop him. Verse 17 during those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and Tobiah's letters came to them. For many in Judah were bound by an oath to him, since he was a son-in-law of Shechaniah, son of Arah. And his son, Je Jeconan, had married the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. These nobles kept mentioning Tobiah's good deeds to me, and they reported my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. Now this is kind of an interesting little part at the end of this at the end of this passage this maybe not obvious exactly what's going on here. But but we see that uh it says many of the nobles in Judah uh excuse me during those days the nobles in Judah sent many letters to Tobiah and letters came to them for many in Judah were bound by an oath to him, and then it goes through and it mentions his, his family tree, or at least part of his family tree here. Now, we see one name mentioned here, uh, Shechaniah, son of Arah. Now, Arah was one of the people who came back with Ezra, which would have been before this time in Nehemiah. And so what it appears that happens by some of these names that we see mentioned here and throughout Nehemiah and the book of Ezra is it seems to be that some of God's people had intermarried with some of these people who were enemies of the Jewish people. And that had gotten them into trouble because there were some family ties there which caused some of the people in Judah to side with Tobiah and have a good relationship with Tobiah. Well, this was a problem because this was causing tension between God's people and what was going on. Now, that may not be clear to us there in that passage, but I think that that's probably the case as we read through Ezra and as we read through Nehemiah. Now, this was a problem that God had warned his people about for a long time, all the way since Deuteronomy. Now, we see in Ezra that this was a problem. In Ezra chapter 9, verses 13 and 14, if you want to turn back there with me, you can. Ezra 9, 13 and 14. This is an, a situation that Ezra seems to be dealing with uh, uh, in, in the book of Ezra as God's people are returning. And that is God's people intermarrying with the other people who are in the land. And this causes problems for God's people and caused big problems in the book of Ezra. And Ezra addressed that. And here we see this problem in Ezra chapter 9 verse 13. After all that has happened to us because of our evil deeds and terrible guilt, though you, our God, have punished us less than our sins deserve and have allowed us to survive, should we break your commands again and intermarry with the peoples who commit these detestable practices? Wouldn't you become so angry with us that you 
excuse me, wouldn't you become so angry with us that you would destroy us, leaving no survivors? So Ezra acknowledges there's some problems. God, we are really guilty before you. Thank you, God, that you haven't given us what we deserve because we deserve a lot worse than what you've given us. But we continue to sin. In what way? By intermarrying with the people that commit these detestable acts. The people, the foreign people in the land were pagans. They worshiped false God and did detestable things. And God's people were not supposed to intermarry with other people from other nations for that reason. That was the reason for it. And in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3, God tells them this, do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. Verse 4, because they will turn your sons away from me to worship other gods. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you and he will swiftly destroy you. So we see that command pretty clear even way back in the law in Deuteronomy. But yet by the time we get to Ezra, things are still not good. I mean, we're, we're getting close to the Old Testament period here by the time we get to Ezra and Nehemiah. But God's people are still sinning in the same way, even after they've been brought out of captivity and back into the land of Judah, uh, the land of Jerusalem. God's people are still sinning in the same way. And that's a big problem that Ezra is addressing. And I believe that that's what uh, Nehemiah is addressing here at the end of this chapter when he, when he points these things out. There are problems that have been caused because of this intermarriage. Now, we need to be careful when we say that because oftentimes uh, we may try to, we may try to in, uh, inflict some kind, of, some kind of racial thought into that. It wasn't, it wasn't a black and white issue. It's not that God was saying don't intermarry with people of another race. That wasn't the issue. It wasn't a racial issue. It was, an, it, was a, it was a sin issue. God said don't intermarry with these other people of these foreign lands, not because they're a different color than you or a different race than you, but because they worship false gods. They worship these gods and they're going to pull you away from me to worship their gods. And so that was the issue. If God's people were to, were to be godly people, then they had to live for God. They could not live for God and these other false gods. They had to live only for God. Ezra and Nehemiah are trying to reestablish the people and strengthen the people in Jerusalem, in the temple, to reestablish uh, what God intended. But yet God's people were still living in sin. And Ezra and here still in Nehemiah, there was still that tension. Why? Because they were disobedient. They were, they were seeking people for husbands and wives that were not godly people. That's the same thing that, that Paul addresses in the New Testament when he says, do not be unequally yoked. Again, that passage is not speaking about any kind of racial anything. It's speaking about Christian people should not marry non-Christian people. That's what Paul is addressing there for the same reason. If a Christian people, a Christian person marries a non-Christian, there's a possibility that that non-Christian is going to pull the Christian away from God. Now, we may say as a Christian, well, I'm going to marry this, this non-Christian person and maybe I can convert them. Well, maybe you can. Lord willing, hopefully you will. But maybe they can convert you. And so we have to be careful. That's why Paul gives us a word of warning. The same type of warning God had given his people uh, throughout the Old Testament. And that's what's being dealt with here at the end of Nehemiah 5. And so we've finally seen that Nehemiah and the people have completed the task before them, but the work is not finished because there's still some trouble brewing in the land. But Nehemiah has proven in chapter 5 and in chapter 6 that he is a good leader, that he is a faithful man of God, he fears the Lord, therefore he does not have to fear Sennacherib and Tobiah and Geshem and those other enemies. He says, I will trust in the Lord, I will not give in, and I will not let the, the enemy thwart my plans. And that's the same thing that Jesus had to go through. Jesus had the same temptations at the beginning of his ministry. Satan tried to tempt Jesus. For what reason? To stop God's plan, to get Jesus not to do what God wanted him to do. But Jesus was faithful to the Father. Even Peter, when Jesus was telling him, look, my time here is short. It's not going to be long. I'm going to be gone. And Peter says, no way. I'm not going to let anybody do into you. And Jesus says to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. What? Peter is Jesus' disciples. Why would he say that? Because that, that seed uh, uh, that was planted, that thought that Peter had 
while he, he had the best intentions when he said that, I'm not going to let anybody hurt you or kill you, Jesus. Jesus knew better that that very seed of a thought came from the devil. Because who doesn't want to see Jesus die on the cross for our sins? Satan doesn't. And he wasn't going to let, let Peter or Satan through Peter talk him out of it. Because that's what happens sometimes, right? I mean, people begin to, to maybe talk us out of things that we should, should do or, or talk us into things that we shouldn't do. And man, what if, what, if, what if Satan working through Peter there, Jesus would have kind of entertained that thought. You know what? Maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I shouldn't die. Maybe I should get my boys to stand up and defend me and use my power to defend me. But Jesus said, no way, enemy. You're coming against me, Satan. You're coming against me, enemy. But I'm not going to let you stop what God has called me to do. That's what Nehemiah did. That's what Jesus did. And that's what we are called to do. So we need to remember Nehemiah as an example. We need to be wise like Jesus and Nehemiah. And when we see the enemy at work, recognize that it's the enemy and say, no way, enemy, I know what you're trying to do. I know you're trying to discourage me. I know you're trying to stop me from doing the work that God has called me to do, but I will not stop. God, be my strength. That's what Nehemiah said, and that's what we need to say in our life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for these good words, and I pray that you'd help us to be more like Nehemiah, because God, I might not be the only one that sometimes fails, sometimes lets discouragement get the best of me, and sometimes is afraid of situations that are before me. But God, I pray that you'd help those times to be few and far between in our life. You forgive us on those times where we fail, that you, you lift us up, dear Lord, you dust us off, you encourage us with your word, you strengthen us with your word, you help us to see people like Nehemiah and remember how they live for you. And most importantly, dear Lord, you help us to see Jesus Christ, how he stood in the midst of adversity, how he didn't give in to any of the devil's tactics, but he knew what you called him to do. And as tough as it was, dear Lord, he continued on. And God, just as you helped Nehemiah have the victory by completing that wall over their, over their enemies, even more so, God, you gave Jesus the victory over the grave and over death and over his enemy, over our enemies, dear Lord, the devil and sin. And God, we thank you for what Jesus did, and I pray that you'd help us to live by and follow his example. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.